this is our last time together. This is video number 27. Congratulations on going through this intense eight-week course. I have endeavored during this time to make the information real and relevant and practical for you. Hopefully, you've taken away some things from the previous 26 volumes of this. COM 215, small groups communication. I said in the very first video, this is the worst way to teach this course. Asynchronous online, so you're just an individual participant on it. Hopefully throughout this course, you have taken away some things, some experiences, some perspectives, and some skills that you can apply. I shall keep posted on this YouTube channel, these 27 videos. So if you ever, in a future course, if you ever need to research something or quote me on something, go back to those uh, 27 videos. I shall have those. Also, please tell your friends in other courses uh, at, at this campus, Western Nevada College, if they need uh, some background or some specific skill training, point them to this video channel. Thanks. Congratulations. This has been an intense semester, and I thought in this final video, I would share with you some general trends, as well as wrapping up some key issues about small group communication. In the first class, I said that communication is the lifeblood of an organization, not only pulsing information through the, informa through the organization, but also keeping the lines of communication open. We have seen in our businesses and nonprofit organizations during this trauma of the last two years now, how without the lifeblood of communication, keeping those lines of communication open during tragedies and traumas and upheavals, the organization crumbles from within. The older I become, and I am a fossil now, uh, the older I become, the more aware I become uh, that giving a commitment to something is sacred, is precious. In the first class, I asked you to make a commitment to this course, to see it through. These eight weeks, I know from each and every one of you, has been pressurized and in some cases traumatic. I started out this semester with you with 31 people enrolled. We've had a couple people drop out very quickly. Um, we had a couple people drop out throughout the semester. I've had one person who still signed up for the course who's never contacted me, never contributed anything. My congratulations to you for living your commitments. Commitments are much more than giving a priority or a promise to something. You have to live those commitments every day. And now that you've made it all the way through this course, take pride and satisfaction that you have lived these commitments. Those things you can prove to yourself that you can do over and over again. I am so excited for you in this bachelor's program in organizations and project management that you will be hearing state-of-the-art information, giving uh, practical application uh, of different skills of different organizations and projects. The future is bright for you. Completing this bachelor's degree here at Western Nevada College uh, it will ensure a lot of your early success and maybe set up some foundations and perspectives for you to leverage in continuing your career success. Your careers will be exciting. Your careers will be things that you will have more control over. And your, your careers will be challenging and even scary at some times during the upheavals of the next five to seven years. With this background you've received in your bachelor's degree here, you will have more opportunities given to you, for presented to you, that you ever imagined before. I felt a little selfish throughout this semester because I was the only one that was in contact with all of the now 25 of you remaining in the course. 
one of the things I did recommend to my division head is maybe implementing it soon or maybe for the next group coming through, there should be a, uh, a web page uh, for people going through uh, this accelerated bachelor's degree program and each course having its own electronic bulletin board, if you will, that you can post things that other people in the same class can go to in terms of what to study for, clarifications, and hopefully that will be implemented in the future. As is, is right now, I'm the only one that had contact with each one of you, and you've had very little, if any, contact with your classmates throughout this course, throughout this program. Let me share some general trends for you. That firstly, all of you, from your communications with me individually, have had challenges this semester ranging from family challenges to work challenges. Uh, even four of you have lost family members through, uh, through COVID uh, and had to grieve and come back from those. For all of you, again, congratulations. I was totally impressed with that one entry, the run reflections entry you gave on writing out for me a business story. These, all of them, were just wonderful and memorable. Even though some of you did not score well on the midterm because you didn't prepare uh, enough for it or don't, didn't have the experience in taking such an essay midterm, I felt privileged of listening to all of your clear, concise, organized uh, answers to the two questions. Uh, that was fun thing for me to read, to, to see not only the quality of you individually, but the quality of the whole class going through this. Where to bring it from here? Keep on learning how to communicate verbally in person, verbally on Zoom live meetings, also electronically, uh, as well as uh, running different types of meetings. You are in a unique position to keep on leveraging this existing base of your communication skills. Keep on improving those. You want to be seen within the organization or within your entire profession as a grand communicator. You can adapt and adopt anything else that comes down the line if you can communicate about that. I hope that all makes sense. I came up with a master handout about a year ago now that looked at managing absolutes. No matter what trends, what type of organization it is, there are some basic principles that seem to be necessary and going on for maximizing the present and going on to the future. I would like to read for you some of them as a summary to some of the things we've covered, as well as some new things to ponder. As we said early on, there's only two types of organizations, whether it is an orchestra, a club, a social organization, a religious organization, a nonprofit organization, or a pro-profit um, business, as well as governmental agencies. There's only two types of organizations. You know what they are, needs-driven and values-driven organizations. Um, although uh, the, the managing those, may some of that may be un, with, outside of your control. Seek to implement that's within your control a values-driven orientation. Along with that, a vivid mission frames the organization. People want to know what the organization's all about. The mission statement, if you will remember, should be a living document everybody should be familiar with and even recite. That's making it real. And then that gives us this framework under which we can start identifying and implementing goals and from which individuals can see what their roles are within that. Always remember those practices that made the organization successful. Too often, if organizations grow very quickly 
or morph into something else or acquire other organizations, it seems to lose its touch with those practices, principles, vision, and mission that initially made them successful. Organizations that lose their way forget their roots. Here's something I never mentioned, and I want you to ponder this. Leadership implies followership. The best leaders in an organization, whether it's a shifter in charge of two people on a crew or a, uh, uh, the top leader of an organization, understands, connects, and empathizes with what will enable or empower people to follow them. Think back if you've ever had bad managers who said we should do it one way and everybody else is doing it the other way. Leadership implies followership. Put yourself in your people's shoes of what will enable or empower them to follow your lead. Remember what we talked about, uh, the, the research I did years and years ago now about the best immediate supervisors when surveying their workers, the best supervisors with the best reputation, listened twice as much as they talked, whereas the inconsistent or bad reputation supervisors did just the opposite. They talked twice as much as they listened. Listening is the most direct way you can show that you care about a person and to open up the lines of communication. Next, the ongoing operational and procedural changes are made from bottom up, not bringing in outside experts to, to do that. Values-driven organizations I have found have at least 65% of their improvements that are suggested from the workers which leads to that old principle I talked about in a previous video about the basic principle of industrial psychology, that old concepts from the 1940s and 50s. And that is when workers feel a part of the decision-making process, they will be more willing to implement it. Even what they suggested was not decided upon. Remember, sometimes there is a command decision or consultive or consensus decision. When workers feel a part of the process, they feel in the know and they will be a lot more on board with whatever is being implemented. Early on, we talked about uh, in our reflections, what's the difference between a team and a group? A team is ongoing, evolving, making everybody's roles seem important within that group. If you're not constantly, if you're in a position of authority, if you're not constantly working on improving the cohesiveness of the team, the morale of the team, you are by default allowing the team to eventually disintegrate into a group. Interestingly, the last team in an organization to view themselves as such, as a team, is the management team. There, I've seen a lot of organizations that have very good managers and leaders and supervisors who work well on their teams, but in terms of them seeing themselves as a part of another team, the management team, that's oftentimes the last group that can sit, start seeing them as a team. Morale is real, as you found out. It does affect productivity and safety and consistency and service to clients and customers is that you as a good manager and leader have to make morale real, address it directly, which is the secret. As we found out in a, in a previous video, regular, consistent performance reviews is the most neglected element of productivity within any kind of organizations. It provides the people the feedback loop on which they can feel a part and work on improving individually. I'm a, still an idealist, even though I've been around organizations for 45 years now. I'm still a, an idealist that the ability to create and sustain a positive work environment is essential. When people enjoy coming to work, producing and contributing, 
um, then they will be a lot more part of the change process. As you will remember, the general strategy of this is to build upon strengths. A lot of times, if you work on strengths, the weaknesses run their course, or you're at the very least in a better position to directly address the weaknesses and overcome those weaknesses. The specific tool of that is to catch people doing something right and then complimenting them for it. Remember that essential question I posed to you in that video on complimenting. Think back, when was the last time you were almost crying out to be complimented to what, what you were doing and who you are mattered to that organization? And think back with a positive, sincere, genuine compliment would have done for you. And then think back what the lack of a compliment did to you. Part of this whole strategy on building on strengths is to compliment people. Deserved, well-timed, and genuine compliments can work wonders for people. As we are winding down this course, COM 215, Small Group Communication, and you are doing your final case study term papers turning in uh, to me, I feel a connection with each one of you. And please, if you're ever on campus in Carson City, especially on Tuesdays and Wednesdays when I'm on campus, please stop by. I'm usually in the Reynolds building. I would love to meet you face to face. Some of you have taken my courses before and that I have ongoing relationships with. Also, by the very fact that you have taken this course and completed this course, that means you are mine forever. So that whatever you need from me, please contact me. If you need a letter of recommendation, I will be get glad to do that. If you ever have a question about something uh, within your organization, just email me. Um, you are mine forever. Whatever I can do from, for you from here, please ask. Also, if you bump into me uh, in Carson City, please come up and introduce yourself to me. Some of the students I know, uh, but a lot of you I don't know. And I've never seen a photo of you uh, on your uh, email account before. And I, would, I feel I have a connection with many of you that I don't know what you look like. So if you ever bump into me on campus or in Carson City, please, please connect with me and we can have a nice conversation about it. One time when I was flying back home to Northern Nevada from a series of consulting engagements um, back in the Midwest, I asked myself this question. Of all the different types of professions or industries or organizations that I have served, was there a person that uh, symbolized the best of that organization that had the reputation for it? And of course, I came up with the notion of, yes, those people were the professional. Beyond that, I've seen some rare occasions where these, these people were actually called the pros pro, the elite of their profession or organization. During this long flight home, I started jotting down what it meant to be the pros pro, the professional. And here are some things I came up with. The professional is in touch with and lives a purpose-driven life. And that's why those last two uh, reflections were so important. So you can start becoming aware of your purpose and live a, pur a purpose-driven life. The professional knows uh, that commitments are special and indeed even sacred. On the other side of the coin, the professional renders humble service, does things behind the scenes, does it because they need to be done. The professional renders humble service. As such, the professional lives priorities. It's not just promising it, it's living those. The professional chooses to be a realistic optimist. The professional also views crises as challenges. We've known the crises that we've encountered, especially during the last five years. The pros, the pros pro views these crises as challenges. 
As such, the professional views the value of striving and even struggling. The professional learns from disappointments and failures and then bounces back. What we've learned from COVID personally and professionally and organizationally is this concept of resilience. It's not how many times you get knocked down. It's how many times you stand back up. The professional makes the most out of change, particularly in a competitive uh, environment. Everybody's reacting the same way. Make the most out of change. The professional, this is an old-fashioned value, uh, does the right thing the first time. The professional trusts, empathizes, and accepts others instead of making these formal or nonverbal judgments of folks, accepts who they are. The professional remembers, appreciates, and is, in grateful, as, is grateful uh, to what they have, what the organization is. We build on that. Like a juggler, the professional juggles the different balls in their life, their career life, their family life, their social life, their health life. And it's this ongoing rhythm of the juggling that keeps things in control and moving forward. The professional as such is, serves as a role model for others, not consciously a lot of times, but who they are by their actions and by their character. The professional never forgets their roots, where they came from. And finally, the professional practices being the best and performing the best every single day. It's not what you've done lately. Is that what you're doing today? Kenny G is a soft jazz uh, musician of the soprano clarinet. And till, still to this day, he practices three hours a day. Does he need to do that? Not really. But he says he really needs to do that. The professional practices, prepares, and refines day in and day out. In this course, COM 2, uh, 215 on small group communication, hopefully you can see that these things are manageable and you can embrace them and adapt to them. And that's your ongoing challenge. Again, I compliment you on what you've done in here, and I wish you well in your futures. This is Tom Kubistant signing off one last time.